my talk starts, uh, which is really funny, with an intervention by my parents. And it's a reverse intervention. It's probably not what you're thinking right now. I went through a short stint as an undergrad, six years. You know, I just rushed right through that. Um, I started school as a biology major on a biology scholarship. I love the study of life and science. And my parents, my junior year in college, pulled me aside and said, we need to talk to you about some of the choices you're making. I said, what is it? Do they know how much time I spend out of the dorms? I mean, what, what are we talking about? And they said, we really think you need to give art another shot. And I had had a series of educators younger that didn't really make me feel that I could pursue it or that there was a future in it or that it was even something I was so passionate about because as a kid, that's all I would do is draw. And they said, we think you're missing out on something. We'd like for you to go back to art. And, you know, the reverse intervention to a field that I could probably make a living in <laughs> to being an artist was, was quite a, a jump on their part. But I agreed. And I, I transferred my junior year in college. I had two junior years or two sophomore years. However, we're going to look at it. Um, to, to the art major, and, and I did good. I, I could do all my classes and everything, and I got to my last two weeks of my senior year, and I realized, oh, this is great. I can do all these art projects, but I'm not an artist. I have no voice. I have nothing that really speaks to me. I could, I could do these things and jump through these hoops, and I had one professor at the, the last two weeks of school said to me, well, what is it that you want to draw? You're going to be out of here in two weeks. And for six years, nobody asked me what I wanted to draw. And I said, I want to draw animals. I relate to animals. I relate to the natural world. It's how I make sense of things. And he goes, I give you permission to draw animals for two weeks. So I did. This is um, a series of drawings I did. And it was, gosh, 13 years ago now. And I just drew animals. And I drew what spoke to me. And at the time was nature and wildlife. And these drawings weren't that big, maybe 14 inches or so wide. And I don't have the originals. These are actually prints. Um, here's another one. It was kind of a playful idea. This is my version of the tea party. In the Dutch culture, everything is fixed by a cup of tea. And uh, this was kind of my version of, of the, the famous Care family tea parties that we would have. After that first series, I graduated, and I went, great. So I've had two weeks of real education, and now I'm, I'm out in the world again. And the same professor that, that had mentioned the animals said, why don't you come back for grad school and really spend some time drawing? So I did. I waited six months. I got back into the program. And this is, um, I did a series of four drawings. And my first graduate professor said, have you thought about scale? I felt like I was just getting educated at this point. And I said, well, they're you know, almost 14 inches long. I mean, how big do you want these drawings? He said, how about 18 by 24? And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't draw something that big. That's out of my, my capabilities. Well, I did a series of four. And these um, were inspired at the same time. I can't just stay in one major. I joined the wilderness program. And um, what I loved about being in the wilderness was every time you're on a backpacking trip and you took a moment to look at the tree, you would notice the ants. You would notice you could keep delving in. You could watch the grass moving. You could watch the rocks in the stream. It was ever-changing. Every time you look closer and closer, there was a new little universe that, to be discovered. So this idea of, of many different universes came from this, this love of, of nature. And I would spend uh, a couple weeks living out in the desert uh, on Lake Powell. Um, also lived in the snow. And uh, I, I couldn't afford real equipment, so those are actually trash bags tied around my feet. <laughs> I didn't mean to actually put this slide up there, but that's pretty cool. Uh, this is the igloo I lived in. And so I spent a lot of time kind of being by myself. And, and these ideas of, of kind of the infinite possibilities with nature started to, to really come through. And here's another example. This is actually Overlook in Zion National Park. And how it relates to this drawing. And here's that idea of going deeper and deeper into it. Um, oh, let me go back. I, I, at the, around the same time, I, I explored a little bit around color. And, and they're kind of a playful. Um, these represent certain people in my life, and I will not say who they are because I think this is being filmed and it's going to come back to haunt me. So um, 
these are kind of a, a fun, uh, fun little studies in color. Again, that idea of kind of universes and, and, and magical places in, in the ordinary kept coming through. <clears throat> here's, a, here's another one. Um, this will look familiar to the rhino piece in there if you look at the horn. After I finished that series, I decided, OK, 18 by 24 is, is tiny. What was I thinking? I want to create these worlds. And to create worlds, you've got to go bigger. And when you live in a 800-square-foot you know, house with like six pets, all you have is the wall space in your house. So all I did was string up paper in different locations in my house in the studio at school. And I also you know, semi-bribed a ceramic student to use his studio as well. And uh, I would have different sections of drawings in different locations. So wherever I drove that day, and wherever I was working that day, that's where I would draw. And this one of me drawing here with the green room is me standing on my bed. <laughs> At the end of grad school, this is the piece that I created. It's um, about 35 feet long by six and a half feet tall. And it's my first mural that I did. This, this was the culmination of my, um, my grad school. And uh, even then, I felt, as soon as I put it on the wall, it still didn't quite do what I wanted it to do. You'd have to get really close to kind of have it cover your whole field of vision. So a lot of new ideas were forming. And um, I graduated school and became um, an elementary school teacher. I had taught at the university, and I loved it. Um, while I was a grad student, I also taught at a private school, and I loved that. I was really drawn to children because I felt I was able to make the most amount of, of kind of ideas and the most amount of creativity that wasn't broken by years of saying by art teachers, you can't do it, or that's not right, or I'm going to put a grade on a piece of artwork, which is insane. And you get a lot of that when you're in college. Oh, I can't do that. It's too. And, and when you're working, so I kept getting younger and younger. And I finally became um, kindergarten through sixth grade art educator. And my job was to make art programs that would work with the core curriculum to reinforce. What? Oh. Not for us, right? Okay. <laughs> Otherwise, I gotta talk a lot faster. Um, so kindergarten through sixth grade art, and um, I loved it. It was great. Um, around the same time, I had my first show outside of grad school, and it was a really successful show. This was a play on that first, in that first book that I showed you, The Tea Party. This is kind of the several years later rediscovering The Tea Party. I thought it was appropriate to go back and revisit my old work when I was done with school as kind of a, you know, comparison to what, how much has changed. Here's a few. Um, these are smaller scale drawings. Um, they're, they're little. I always work in conjunction large with small. Sometimes it's great to be able to finish something. And the large scale works can, can take up to years to complete. So I always do a series of small that also work as compositional studies. And those ideas sometimes grow into larger ones. Here's a couple more ideas. Oh, I'm going to go back. Back. Right around this time, I uh, got pregnant with my daughter and started a family. And I think anybody that knows what that's like means everything else slows down. So I was a teacher, and I was a mom, and that was about all I could handle. And you know, I made it sure I fed the dogs every morning. And, but it was a lot of commuting, a lot of driving, a lot of um, you know, teaching, and then driving to my mom's to pick up my daughter. And I just didn't have time to draw, and I thought, that my life would be a teacher and a mom, and that's great. And that was fabulous. And I was happy with what I was doing, and I felt fulfilled. And I just honestly didn't have room for anything else in my life. A few years into teaching, as, as, uh, as my daughter was getting older and she became more independent, I started really feeling this loss in my life. And as these events started to happen in my life, I needed an escape, and I no longer had it. I had let go of this thing that was so important to me that I had taken for granted. And I couldn't do it anymore. And I didn't have the time. And I didn't have a studio. And I didn't have space. And I started to realize that I was not happy anymore. And I needed to go back to art. And uh, my husband and I drywalled half of our garage. And we made the decision for me to start drawing. 
Around the same time, a good friend of mine who's from Michigan said that there's a large art contest in Michigan every fall and that she wants to do it. Can I go with her? And I said, no, it's insane. Can't go to Michigan and just take time off of work. And we talked about it, and I laughed. And a couple months later, I called her back, and I said, yeah, I'm, I want to do it with you. We're going to go. We need to do something. I need to do something. And uh, this idea of a large-scale elephant's drawing happened. And I said, I'm going to have it done for Art Prize 2012. I need a date. I can't just do whenever I want. So I had this date on my calendar 18 months away. And I started drawing. Here's my studio at my house. And I started hanging paper, and I just started drawing. And the idea of elephants was the foundation of this drawing, because I did a lot of research on animals while I was pregnant. I didn't draw, but I thought a lot about it. I know that sounds weak, but when you think a lot for years, and it starts to develop in your head, and you all of a sudden start drawing again, it's like an explosion happened. And all of this pent up expression finally could come out, and this idea that elephants have a history and a memory and a sense of family felt appropriate. So I started drawing elephants, and I didn't know how big it was. I didn't know what was going to happen. So every weekend, every holiday, every morning, and every evening for the next 18 months, I spent in my studio. I would come after work, and I'd work a few hours when my husband got home, and then we'd go to bed and get up usually between 3 and 4 AM and draw till about 6 when I went to school. And that was my routine for about 18 months. And I would just rotate two panels through my studio at a time. And here's just a couple more. Uh, my process is pretty simple. At the end of this, I have a couple videos. All I use to draw is a sock, some charcoal dust, and carbon pencils and erasers. And, and that's it. So material-wise, it's pretty simplistic. Um, in the corners are funny. This is not a flattering picture. My husband had to put it in. I, I would lay on the floor and draw. And so I wear a respirator, obviously, for, for dust reasons. But um, I get like this permanent like broken blood vessel on my nose thing from this. And you could see it's about four feet to the door. So you, know, you, you could see it was, it was difficult to, to step back. And I had to do a lot of imagining and changing of perspective to make it work in that tight frame. And here's a, here's a few detail shots. In a lot of my work, you see ropes and pulleys and connections. And that's exactly what it is. It's about connecting. It's about connecting our loss with the loss of nature and, and trying to draw this overall feeling of, of connection that, that we lose. And um, I, I try to mirror our, our losses with, with the loss of our natural environment, too. So a lot of times, I choose animals to help tell that story. And I use a lot of human attributes to, to personalize that. Here's kind of a close-up of one of the areas. This area is maybe about seven or eight inches um, wide. And it's a series. This is kind of my version of a mobile. And everything is connected by a tiny string. Here's the center panel of that piece. And about halfway through, uh, primates started coming in, this piece that I thought was going to be mostly elephants. And I just let them happen, because you can't fight them. My drawings just happened, and there was a lot of people and a lot of events that started to happen around this that needed to be worked out in pencil. And so that's what I did. In the center of this mural is my daughter, a, a picture. She's not a gorilla. A picture of my daughter um, as a gorilla and with her bunny ears that she used to wear. Um, w when I would be working in the studio, I would still have these pangs. She would knock on the door and, and be wearing these bunny ears, like, come in and play. And I had to say, I'm sorry, I'm drawing. And to kind of give up that important family time to do this really changed the context of my work, that I had to give something up to do it. And it made it valuable and important in my life. And here's an even uh, closer up. There's the scissors right there dangling above that thread that's connecting us. Also, the, the mouth is sewn shut, and the ears and the eyes on the other, uh, the, three, the three main chimps here. And it's the hear no, see no, speak no, evil. A few, about a week before I was going to fly out to Michigan, my friend bought a refrigeration warehouse. 
And he said, if you want it for a day, the refrigerators don't come for a day, you could go hang that piece up that you've been like trying desperately to find some place to hang it all together. So I loaded the whole family in a truck and we, um, we finally got to hang it and I was able, through the, you can see it's unfinished in some areas, I was able to hang it, trim it, and kind of measure and figure out what I could do in those last sections before I left for Art Prize. So this was the first time in about 17 months that I'd ever seen it together. Grand, uh, Art Prize is a really amazing art competition. I didn't know what I was getting into except that I got chosen to be into Art Prize. And you have to have a venue choose you, and you have to choose a venue. And there's 167 venues, and there's about 1,700 artists, and you go through kind of a matchmaking process. Since my work is large and on paper, there was only two venues that would be able to house the piece. So I was lucky enough to connect with Grand Rapids Art Museum. But they don't hang it for you. They just say, here's the space. The art competition has nothing to do with the museum. You bring your own staff, and you hang your piece. So I brought my mom and a friend, and we stayed with a volunteer. And uh, we hung the piece at the Grand Rapids Art Museum. And Art Prize runs for about three weeks. And you basically stay by your artwork for three weeks while people come by and ask you questions. And there was this moment of sheer panic after I took this photo of, oh my gosh, I took a month off of work with no pay. I left my family behind. I'm in Michigan, I don't know anyone. And now I have to stand next to a piece of artwork. They're gonna think I'm a total freak. I'm just standing here like, what am I gonna do? And the idea came to me is, I wanna create an environment. And on these giant museum walls, it, it dwarfed my drawing. It wasn't what I wanted. When you walked into the space, it looked like a window and I wanted it to be an environment. So I met the curator and she said no. I said, can I draw on the wall? She said no. I said, just maybe just this little section right in between, just to connect it, just, you know, just a little bit. She's like, okay, just a little bit. And the next day I came in and I said, okay, so this stuff comes off the wall super easy. Can I just do another little section? She's like, no. And I said, yes, please. And then I said, oh, I'll paint the wall. And she said, well, there's a, there's a, you, you can't just paint the wall, you have to hire a company because we have special contractors. And I, she's like, it's gonna be $2,100. And I said, oh, sure, no problem. And I was thinking, good luck collecting on that because I don't think I had that in my, in my account. So sure, I'll hire somebody to paint this wall. As long as you let me draw for the next few weeks, I'll take care of the wall, no problem. So she said, okay. So every day for the next four weeks, I drew on the walls. And the drawing started off, I believe, 36 feet by eight feet, and it ended to be over 46 feet by 13 feet. I drew on the floor, on the ceilings, in the hallway, on the grate, the air conditioning vent, the podium, and anywhere else that I could reach. Um, and that's what I did for four weeks while Art Prize was going on. And it was one of the most important things I've ever done because it showed me the real direction that my work needed to go. And it also got me over the fear of people because I believe over you know, 200 or 300,000 people came through that year during Art Prize. And I, I think I spoke to, I don't know, so many people that I started to be more comfortable. And here's kind of what it looked like at the end of the four weeks. So it went well, because I won Art Prize in 2012. And um, thank you. It was a very, very exciting moment, and it was such a great thing to know that all that time spent in the studio, and I believed in the work, and I believed in the message, and then other people did too, was the biggest pat on the back you could ever get as tr an artist trying to come back out of not being a creative person for quite a while. After Art Prize, a couple strange things started to happen. People wanted to show it again, and when they wanted to show it, they wanted it to be similar to what I did. So I've been traveling with the elephant's piece, and each time it goes up, I recreate a new environment for it and draw some new drawings. I pull the panels apart and add things, and this is at the hub at Art Prize in 2013, and these uh, frames over here was a surprise. The museum ended up cutting out the wall that I drew on and framing it. 
And I didn't have to pay for that, because that was, that was out of my control. And so now the piece also in the collection with the piece are a series, I think there's 10 or 13 drywall cutouts of the wall from the, the museum that go with it. Here's a line I drew in addition to the elephant's piece. Here it is again, it's a little bit of a dark slide. Um, this past um, spring and summer I spent at the Yellowstone Art Museum in Billings, Montana, and we reinstalled the elephants, and this time it came to be over uh, 52, it's almost 60 feet, and I was able to draw three extra on e in between each panel of elephants, so six extra elephants in this installation. There's a little bit of close-up, but it was also, they had a really cool um, lift, so I got up to, I think, almost 18 feet on this drawing. And I just came back from a trip two weeks ago of reinstalling it, and I'll, and here's kind of a close-up of some of the drawings I added on this last trip. Um, I just, I'm gonna show just a series of other small works for another show that I had. And um, this is about the same time after Art Prize, things started to change a lot all of a sudden. Everybody wanted to show, and all I had was a 36 foot long drawing of elephants. <laughs> and uh, I had to draw, and I left teaching that winter. I taught through the winter semester, and I got a studio, and I've been a full-time artist. It'll be two years this, this winter. And uh, I didn't come out of the studio, so th this, is, this is what I do now every day. Um, this, this drawing is funny because, uh, not f it's funny now, but when I first moved in my studio, I had all this paper up and I just moved, and I'm like, this is amazing, and I hear this pop, and water floods the whole studio, and the pipe had burst between the front tenant and the back house where I work, connected to the washing machine. So all this water flooded the studio, and I just stood there in amazement with you know, several pieces of eight foot tall drawings around. And the contractor, oh, he's a genius. He um, left this much space of drywall. So it flooded the studio, but it never climbed the drywall. And I was able to clean it all up before it damaged any of the paper. Don't go, a couple more slides. So this is kind of a reference to that. Um, Dominic Monaghan from Lost and Lord of the Rings was a fan of my work, so he came to the studio, and he wanted to see how I drew, and he does a show on the BBC about animals, so he, he's really involved with the, the animal world as well. So he came to my studio, and this is him posing for his drawing. These two are part of his collection right now, and a lot of the animals on there are important animals that he has in his collection which I would never go to his house because it's like a series of really strange animals that run loose in this house, including insects and reptiles. And this is uh, the first two larger scale drawings I did after Art Prize, and it's the light and the dark bears, and it was kind of to symbolize that idea of falling or floating and storm. Everything changed so quickly for me in that small time frame that I didn't know how to make sense of it, and I'm still kind of working through that. And so these are, these are a couple examples, and in the work, I pull in a lot of references to family and memory. These three bears, um, is, one's mine, one's my sister's, and one is my brother's, and he has an arrow through his kidney. When I was young, my brother um, was very sick with kidney failure. So we had a clean household, and he was on peritoneal dialysis. And it was a really hard way to grow up to see your little brother suffer that much. And also, this idea that every time I was sick, I was a danger, and I would have to leave. And so every time I was sick, I'd have to find a friend or a family member, because it could, in essence, you know, be the end of my brother if he got you know, a flu that was bad. Or... So growing up, it was a really, really hard to see my parents have to deal with that. And that idea of sickness comes through in a lot of my work. He just received his second kidney transplant a few months ago, and he's doing really good. A lot of people ask what my sketchbook looks like. That's my wall in my studio. I don't really have a sketchbook, but when an idea pops up, I do a very rudimentary sketch, and it's not beautiful. 
but it gets the idea down because the drawing part is a lot easier to me than that idea. And when that magic hits, I draw it on the wall. And this is what it became. That sketch happened the day I found out my dad had brain cancer. I might have to go through this faster than I thought. He lived a couple weeks after the diagnosis before he passed. This drawing is all about that. And we'll move on. Around the same time, I felt it was really important to remember. So I took a photo of my daughter at the same time and uh, created this idea of kind of remembering a moment through symbols. Her name in Old English means king's crown. So that idea of lions and strength I wanted to remember. So I braided her hair into the lion's manes and all of the small things in here symbolize something from her childhood or my childhood that could be remembered forever. That's the bear from the other drawing coming through again and her holding it. Her blankie is also called B, which is over on the, the arm here. Here's another lovely sketch. This, the second portrait I did of my daughter is a little bit more um, I think suitable to her personality, which is a wolf, because <laughs> she's kind of a monster, but in a good way. She's strong and she's powerful and she says what she means. And uh, I use a lot of photo reference <laughs> for my, my drawings and sometimes these drawings just happen and boy did she want to pose for this drawing. So both of those poses are actually her in different tutus. And I kind of like to juxtapose that strength and beauty and fragility all together in my drawings. So you could see all from start to finish kind of the process. And I just wanted to put in a new, a couple of photos of my new studio, which a, a lot of people here, thanks so much for coming, um, saw my studio in Burbank and uh, it's about you know eight times bigger than my garage one and I was able to hang a lot of my work, so every time I come in, there's never a shortage of things for me to do, and I don't have to waste so much time hanging paper and taking it down. Here's just another, another view. Here's the, here's the piece for State of the Art, and um, the series of, of three rhinos in the center. Here's the, the bunny ears that you saw in the elephant's piece come back as a reminder of my daughter. Um, the horns in this were to represent kind of that idea of consumption and consuming things that are very limited. And it was completed at the year anniversary of my father's passing. So the two screaming bears, one breathing in, one breathing out, made an, made an entrance back in. And I don't pre-plan these drawings and I didn't know they were coming back in, but they came back in and, and that's where they'll stay. This is another drawing that accompanies the drawing that's here, that's still in my studio, work in progress, and I'm pushing kind of that idea of consumption a little bit further. And here's um, a picture of a piece that's not released yet. I, I don't know if I, I whatever, whatever. It's gonna be out in like two weeks. So in, in two weeks I go to Grand Rapids Art Museum and I did a large scale commission for them, and this is kind of a tale of art prize. Here's my hear no evil kind of play, uh, the stitch across the head represents my father. And here's a piece, and the slide's really dark because I, I didn't get a great photo. This is a piece, I'm going to Paris in uh, three weeks for my first international art opening, and this is the piece that they chose. And it's about eight feet tall by three and a half feet wide, and it's called the Pregnant Bison. And I apologize, the quality of it's not so great. And I just want to do a quick slide about how memory plays a role in a lot of my work. I was convinced as a child I was a unicorn for a very long time, probably longer than would be recommended by any kind of psychologist. And uh, my mom found this picture of me uh, with my unicorn outfit that she made out of her curtains in the living room. Uh, this is a series um, that I did more recently and it's called the Aches and Pains series. So you have the earache, 
you have the toothache, you have the headache, and you have the backache. And this kind of came from that idea of thinking about my, my dad's brain tumor and these growths, these unnatural but natural growths that happen and the pain that's associated with them. And uh, just a couple slides about what I'm working on now in the studio. This is my newest um, mural piece. It's about eight feet by 14 feet, possibly bigger, I haven't decided. And it's a series of zebras and uh, tigers kind of falling from the sky. There's a couple close-ups. The stripes will all be pulled off and connected and disconnected. And here's a couple more. And this is very much a work in progress, but I wanted to include it so you can see the different stages. Here's another close-up. Both the animals are touching at some point. Here's another. And there's the sketch for it on the right. <laughs> so, and I, sometimes I have to write what I draw because even I can't understand what it is I was trying to do on the wall. Um, after this, I have a, a series of two or three little time lapse things. I don't know if you're interested in seeing them. They're, they're like two to three minutes each, or if you'd like to do questions or answers, or, or if you want to do that after. I don't. You want to do the videos? There's three. Okay, so it's going to be a couple minutes. Okay. This is the progress on the tiger piece. I spent a lot of time texting too, so don't look at that. See, I erased the whole head of that zebra. That's all I have for that one. Another one, or? Okay, no, no offense. 
I think that was six. Six or eight. I, I don't know, I, I cut them off on my drop cam and then we, we kind of cut and paste. I, I think it's six or eight days. You can count the outfits, that's how I keep them. Although I wear similar things to the studio every day, so it's hard, you can't really do that. That actually wouldn't be fair. Um, this one is the light and dark bears, and this is actually my old studio, so you'll see the angle is, is kind of off. That's because I was, I was responsible for this one, so that's why it's a little bit off. <laughs> Sometimes she comes and cleans because I'm fast. on this penguin thing and I just erased it in like 30 seconds. Oh, that's really dark. Oh, my God. Just to the original idea if something feels better or different, I usually just go for it. Here's the start of the three bears on the on the dark bears. I like the idea of time lapse too. I've done several for her.
And there's one more, but I think, oh, and there's an advertisement too in case somebody wants that. Um, I don't know if there's, there's one more, we, we're on time or we're good or, yeah, yay? Raise, raise your hand if, <laughs> if you want to see it. If not, you can, I won't be mad. Okay, the, the next one is, is actually not a, I don't think it's a time lapse. I think it's, oh, this is us time lapsing the installation of the elephants for the first time. So you could kind of see a little bit. Oh, and I went crazy with like Bjork music too, so I hope you're into that. If not, it's going to be a long five minutes. Uh, the wall was so rough, that's what we're doing right now. We went through about 17 rolls of masking tape. The walls, it was a refrigeration warehouse, so it had these crazy, spiky, drywall tapey walls. And so we had to tape over all the rough areas so it wouldn't tear the paper when we hung it. So the prep work took, I gotta say, four hours to prep that wall. Look at all the tape we're putting up to get it ready to hang the paper on it. The paper is just a, you know, a 90 pound um, archival paper. The company went out of business because as it turns out, there's maybe three of us in the world that want paper that big. Um, but it's a, it's a really great quality paper, but it's, you know, it's only 90 pounds. You can't hang it over that rough of a surface without damaging it. I bribed them all with a McDonald's lunch. They love me a lot because that's all I could do for them. No, I don't use any fixative on my work. It seals the paper, it changes the surface. Um, I'm just not happy with it. And I, I really think archival-wise, carbon on paper would last a lot longer than any kind of synthetic surface you put on it. She draws on the walls, and I started that. We treat her like a prisoner, at least when she was two or three, because she used to smuggle Sharpies into her room. And so we had to do like a full pat down every time she went to the back, you know, into her bedroom. Cause she just, well mom draws on the wall, so I'm gonna do it too. Um, now I have a whole corner in my studio that she gets to draw on. So if she comes to my studio, she has her corner that she gets to draw and paint on the walls. And she's technically not supposed to be on the, the drawing side. Technically, but she always comes over and makes me real nervous, especially with pastels or something. the research. I used a series of, of photo references. I used um, humans to model for me, as you could see in, in some of those, those photos. Uh, when I use photo reference, I can use up to 50 different photos of an elephant to draw that elephant. And then at a certain point, it becomes uh, not an issue because I like to obviously add my own imaginative uh, qualities to it. I like some of the readability of using photo reference and some of the structural ideas, but I like to see what happens after, after that's gone. That's my neighbor Phil, came to photograph it. That, my brother and I goofing around in front of the time lapse. <laughs> and I did, I spent a little bit of time like matching it up and figuring out where some more masses needed to go to balance the composition. But the most tedious part was taking it down and trimming paper because I'm such a slob in the studio, I never took the time to do that. So the tops and the bottoms of all of them had to be squared off and, um, and cropped. In this, in this it's just thumbtacked onto the wall because I had to crop the tops and the bottoms off. When it went to get installed, and similar to how it's installed here, it's a series of applique pins, mostly across the top and some on the sides and some on the bottom, and it supports the paper.
Yeah. Yeah, these are all taken down. And I don't know if you can, even my great aunt who was 97 was, came to the, the refrigeration warehouse in North Hollywood to, uh, to see it up. That's the three center panels. And that, that's it. Um, yeah.